Very happy new year to you all. Um, I hope you've managed to get some rest over Christmas uh, and that you're all safe and well in these trying times. I'm really delighted that David is able to join us today for the third of our three webinars. Um, this one obviously was the first one scheduled that um, we had some technical difficulties with, but I'm delighted that probably like you, I've done a lot of learning on uh, how to use these platforms and um, really delighted to be able to share this content with you today. So um, the theme of today's um, presentation is building a cohesive strategy around vision and intent. And this was one of the leadership areas that people wanted uh, to know more about really how you go about um, uh, ensuring that you have real alignment through your organization uh, with regard to your vision and, and intent. So I'm delighted to, to welcome Sir David. Thank you very much again for your time uh, and uh, over to you. Thanks very much, Tony, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's nice to see you again. Happy New Year. Um, and I hope the first couple of weeks of term haven't been too difficult and too trying. Um, so, so yes, this was the session that we planned to do at the very beginning, um, and and it's quite. I guess it's quite broad based uh, in the sense that it's that relationship between uh, creating a vision for what it is you want to deliver, um, but also thinking about what the strategy might be that sits behind it. And so, uh, I've tried to to design this uh, slide deck um, for a range of different scenarios and for a range of roles that you might be doing. So. If you're leading a school, if you were ahead, I think it's relevant to that. But also if you're a middle leader, a subject leader, a phase leader, hopefully it'll 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 resonate for you as well um, in, in terms of that as well. So I'm going to try to root it around how, how you build this this concept of a vision and strategy and intention. Um, but I'm also going to see it through the purpose of school improvement and make it very much focused around around that as well as that's the core business that we're that we're clearly involved in. So uh, if I could go to the next slide. So I think when you're having a very broad brush debate like the one we're having around something that's quite dense around vision and strategy, I think it's quite clear to have a, a sense of um, where you stand on a few key principles around that. And so these were the three that I thought I would position at the beginning of the, of the session this evening. Um, and, and, I'm, and I'm working on the basis that one of the things we're, we're trying to do in terms of building a vision is thinking about how we work together with other people how we work uh, with other staff, with other teams and with other schools. And so for that reason, um, I want to talk a little bit about the benefits of collaboration um, and, and are people really clear about what the goal and what the purpose is around that and, and why that would be such an important area for you to think about because because collaboration is one of those terms that we use in the education sector where everybody knows uh, what it means. People in general think it's a good thing to be involved in. But actually, it's one of those things, if it lacks a little bit of clarity and a little bit of pace and momentum, it can be very difficult to sustain really meaningful partnership in that way. So I want to talk a bit about that. I also want to talk about this uh, thorny issue of alignment and autonomy. Um, and uh, some of the things that I've been thinking about and working on recently, I've, I've, I've developed a sort of a phrase which I use quite a lot these days called the not invented here syndrome. Um, and what I mean by that is that I think for some schools and for some leaders and teachers, it's quite hard sometimes to conceptualize that the practice that we are designing and delivering and leading in our schools actually is not as strong as we sometimes think it is. And that, that there are benefits to be gained from looking at how other people are doing this work and considering whether we should align the way that we think with other people rather than just simply hang, carry on doing what we've always done. And I'll say a bit more about that as well. And then the third one is about how do we build the opportunities for people, uh, if you're in a trust, for example, or in your school workforce? How do we make clear what our talent strategy is going to be uh, around that and how, and how we want people to to think about their role in that, both as recipients of it, but also as people who might be developing some of that. So those are the hooks that I want to hang the first 20 minutes or so of the, of the call this evening around. And then on the next slide, I want, I want to nudge it one stage further um, and, and just make a point about why I think it's so important that we continue to think about how we work together um, 
uh, not just because uh, collaboration, as I said, is inherently probably a positive, but I think the times that we're working in say that we really do need to think about this very cleverly, very carefully. And I, and I think it's predicated on what I've called these four strands uh, uh, about why partnership is such a, such a strength and why I hope for those of you that are working in, 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 in Plymouth, that there'd be some synergy with the way that you're working and how your schools are working together. The first one is this, that it's very clear that no one school or even one trust can possibly have all the answers to the questions that we're posing at the moment about the improvement that we need to do in our education system. Uh, it's just not realistic to assume that everybody has addressed all of those thorny issues that, uh, that, that every school is facing. And as a result of that, it therefore can't really be true that any school has the monopoly on challenge. Um, I mean, I'm sure you've been to events where you've heard people talk about their communities and their context and they rattled off the percentage of kids on free school meals and they talk about the IDACI indicators and things like this. But it's, that's just context. This notion that everybody has got some degree of challenge is where the education system needs to move towards. And it's a really important part of how we lead, I think, that we recognise that our, our challenges are relevant to the challenges that our colleagues in other parts of the city or the community have. My third um, challenge and the third strand is around capacity and, and where that capacity sits and, and a kind of view, I suppose, that no single school or organisation has all the capacity to solve all of its own educational challenges on its own, that it needs to work in partnership and draw upon expertise elsewhere. And then the fourth one, which I think is a really important one, and it's certainly topical at the moment, you know, this notion, and I've seen a couple of these examples on Twitter in the last 10 days or so where I'm not going to name them, but, but where schools and some school leaders are talking about the success they've had in lockdown and, and how good their response has been and how successful their remote learning is. And, and it's just nonsense because actually nobody has truly cracked this yet. It's, it's too sophisticated a challenge and it's too early in the, in the evolution of it for anybody to claim that they've been able to resolve that issue entirely. So that last point then, about our collective responsibility uh, as teachers and as leaders as, as, and as educationalists. We should, we should never be content if we see another school in difficulty. We should want to do whatever we can to help. And I think if you, if you subscribe to those four fundamental strands about nobody having the monopoly on challenge, nobody having the monopoly on capacity and answers, and, and nobody um, being able to dip out of a conversation about how we help a school in trouble, then actually you begin to build the underbelly of what collaboration can look like uh, across the system. So if I move on uh, one to the next slide, um, I want to talk about how, how we take vision and strategy and, and use it to underpin school improvement. Uh, and I think there are four steps to this. Uh, and, and you'll know better than I do individually where you sit on these in, in these steps and, and to what extent your current role enables you to be deep inside these or whether you're you're just observing it. But I thought it's a useful place to start from because I think for me it sets out for me the beginning of, of the, the strategy of how we improve schools. The first step uh, is very much about the things you've heard me talk about on the other two sessions, the accountability session particularly, where we talked about values and we talked about behaviours and beliefs that become the cultural foundation of the school. This is the underpinning of vision, because a vision only exists in a vacuum if you take it and separate it from the values of the organisation. So if, if you have a vision, for example, that all of your schools are going to be outstanding, that's not a vision, that's just an outcome of a vision. Because actually, you, the, the degree to which you can deliver it is not entirely based upon you. It's, in, it's entirely based upon what an inspector thinks on the day that they visit your school. So becoming an outstanding organisation in the Ofsted badge sense is beyond your, your remit. You can only do your best to get close to it. What you can do in this space, though, is to talk about the, the way in which you choose to invest in classroom and practice so that you put your resources in the front line, the way that you think about professional development of people, the way you give people feedback the way you incentivize and incentivize and motivate them. These are some of the things that underpin the vision. So to simply talk about an outcome of a vision is a contradiction around the values and beliefs. So being really clear about what you believe in, in your team, in your department, in your phase, in your school is really important. The second step, once you define that, I think, is to think about how you develop the school improvement plan that starts uh, and is rooted in the classroom practice, in teams, 
um, that work together to improve classroom practice and how the individual schools and the collection of schools work together. So a school improvement plan that sits in my office as the head teacher that has some very broad brush um, objectives, which are probably quite sensible ones, um, which talk about behavior or the quality of teaching or the quality of assessment, but doesn't draw upon the practice that already exists, is going to come upon um, a clash, I think, between what the strategy thinks it's doing and what's really happening inside our classrooms. So a school improvement plan that you might be responsible for, even if it's improving a team or a department, has to start from the basis of where your weakest classroom practice is uh, and work from there and develop that. The third step is around building this talent management strategy, which again, you've heard me talk about in the previous two sessions, which I, which I think is really important. Um, and many of you will have been the recipient of, of, of talent management strategy, um, whether that's in terms of succession planning, which gets you to where you are now, or just great professional development. But, but the, the, the challenge for middle leaders and senior leaders is to, to see the flow that, uh, that talent management works through which enables you to think a little bit about how, so first of all, how do you, how do you identify it? How do you identify the talent uh, in your team? The second one is how you codify it and how do you determine what that talent is? The third is how do you deploy it? And where, what do you want it to do? Um, in, you, know, you might decide you've got a very, very talented year two teacher and the best contribution that that person can make this year is to teach year two brilliantly, and that's fine. But you might also want that year two teacher to talk to year three teachers about continuity because they've done something remarkable that they haven't been doing in year three, for example. So the talent management strategy isn't just about developing people. It is very much about thinking about how we develop um, the, the wider improvement strategy, which talent is a, is a key part of it. And the fourth element, I'm, I'm not sure how many of you this evening uh, in, in the group are, are in a governance role as well as your other role, but, but even if you're not, we sometimes uh, forget to talk about governance in, in, in terms of strategy and vision. And for me, this is about how we help our, our governors, whether they're governors in local governing bodies in the maintained sector or academy trustees in the academy sector, to ask the right questions about the performance of the school. And here, leaders have a really important role to play. Um, and, and it's the way in which leaders provide really strong um, data and evidence and narrative of the improvement journey. And I don't mean a set of board papers that are unreadable because they're 150 pages long. I mean something that's really succinct and to the point that makes very clear what, the, what it is that the governing body needs to be aware of, the things that are working and the things that are more risky. And I think when we think about the vision that we have for how we improve our schools on this continuum from values to the, the improvement plan, to developing people, to how we govern and quality assure it, you have the, make, the beginning of a matrix approach to something that, that can be really powerful in terms of improving standards. The next slide um, I've used before, but, but again, I think it's worth just reminding ourselves of a couple of features of this, because one of the things that you might be thinking about right now is, particularly if you're in perhaps in, your, in a relatively new role or in a, in a role that you've done for some time, but where the vision and the plan is changing, as it might be in, in COVID, and you've been tasked to come up with an action plan or an improvement plan, then you need a way to start this off. And you need that opening, probably the opening page, no more than that, two or three paragraphs that talks about what underpins the actions you're now going to describe. And that's why the first or the lower three blocks on this pyramid are so important. Um, the mission, I, I mean, I've done this very high level, why your organisation exists. Your organisation might be your school or it might be your team or your department. But if, for example, if I go back to an earlier stage of my career, when I was a head of creative arts um, in, in, a, in, in a secondary school, my mission as the head of creative arts was to provide as many children um, who came through our corridors of music, art, drama and dance with a creative education. That was that was the, the mission. That's why the arts faculty existed fundamentally. The vision then was very much about, so how do we describe how we're going to do it? What the, I call it the destination of the ambition. So I want to give every child that I teach and who comes through my faculty or through my department an opportunity to be creative once a week. And then the vision is how do I fulfill that, that, that obligation? How do I fulfill that expectation? And then the strategy is really important here because this is the shorter time frame. This is the time frame of maybe half a year or an academic year where you talk about the specific things that you're going to do right now 
over the coming months and the coming weeks, um, not necessarily the next two to three years, because that's part of the vision and the mission. And, and, if, and if you think about a paragraph around each of those, then it starts to make sense that you begin to write something which people can access and understand their role in it. Because one of the things you have to be able to do, I think, when you're, when you're designing um, an improvement plan is you have to help other people make sense of their role in it. So if I'm an if I'm an NQT just started, I'm in my what well, I'm in my second full full term of teaching, and you're designing an improvement plan um, to improve standards in the team that I'm a member of as an NQT, I probably haven't encountered this before. I haven't probably experienced what this this cycle of improvement planning looks like, and therefore I need you to really be clear to me about the how, the what, and the why. So why are we doing this? How are we going to do it? And what do you want me to do, me personally? What's my role in this? And if I've been teaching for 25 years, this is probably the 25th improvement plan I've seen. Um, and I wasn't that enamored with the previous 24. So how am I going to think that this is going to be different? And that's why the, the greater clarity you can bring to making explicit why, why we're doing this, the, the how around this, the how in terms of what the bigger picture is and what the what is your role in it, the, the easier you bring clarity to that. And if you bring clarity, you bring opportunity for people to contribute. And that's a really important part of it. If I go one stage further onto the next slide here, um, this is this is the planning cycle that I used to use a lot um, when I was leading the Cabot Federation in Bristol. And I, and I used it with a number of trusts in the Southwest and, and nationally when I was the NSC. Um, and, it's, and it's my attempt to talk about how do you lead strategic improvement on a, on a single PowerPoint slide. Uh, and it's not complicated it's 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 a cycle and once you've been around the cycle once you then repeat the cycle so for example you start in the top left hand corner um, you revisit the mission the vision the strategy and the values and behaviors you just check in with those that the things that you said you believed in and the things that everybody signed up to are still the same things because it's useful to revisit that and make sure that we haven't lost some of that and that the traction is really deep on that and then we move into the bit where leaders really do begin to think about how they, I guess, how they how they demonstrate their leadership capability, which is a diagnosis of need. Because if you're trying to turn a team around or a school around, the reality is there might well be 15 to 20 different things that you have to engage with that, that actually you need to improve all of them. But you can't do all of those things in one go. It's too big and people get swamped by the scale of it and then, then lose, lose interest in it because it's just too, too awesome a challenge to deal with. So the diagnosis of need phase of this is really important in terms of being very precise about the things that you want to do. So uh, a bit of the school improvement work that I engaged in uh, when I was when I was national commissioner looked at schools who had um, who had been in real trouble for quite a long time had, had spent a long period over over 20 years bump, <clears throat> bumping along the bottom of the education system uh, never getting above a three on Ofsted inspections um, spending at least 70 to 80 percent of each of, of, of that of that time period below the floor target and and then there was a group of those schools that broke away from that and started to get good judgments and started to see their performance improve. Uh, there were about 60 schools altogether. And over the course of a month uh, in the 2017-18 academic year, we brought them into London and we spent time with each of them and talked about what it was that they did. And the diagnosis of need almost in every single case was where they started the improvement journey from. Once they'd done the initial diagnosis, they then talked about the prioritization. So which elements of this diagnosis are we going to start with, first of all? And there tended to be three things. There were more than three, but the three that came up most frequently when schools that were in special measures that were trying to improve to require improvement and then to good. The three things that they did most frequently was the first one was around behavior. And not just about um, a behaviour policy, although that was an important part of it. It was about how every adult in the building took responsibility for improving behaviour collectively. It wasn't just the person, the deputy head, for example, in charge of behaviour standards. It wasn't just their role. It was everybody engaging around that. The second area that everybody um, focused around was the quality of teaching. Um, and, and not from the point of view that we were talking about, we're going to have 90% of our teachers good and outstanding by Christmas, but we were going to start from where we are right now and we're going to incrementally improve teaching in every classroom. But we're going to recognise that that's going to take us somewhere between two and three years to get us exactly where we want to get to. But every term, every 100 day cycle that goes round, we're going to see an improvement in the quality of teaching across the school. 
And then the third one, um, interestingly enough, was around that relationship between data collection and feedback and how they stopped collecting data so frequently. They stopped doing data trawls every month or even every half term in some cases, did it, did it less frequently, but made more of the data in terms of giving feedback to children and to teachers. And so it was really interesting how a group of schools that for, from the length and breadth of the country, who were all finding things difficult uh, and had standards that they were concerned about, who'd all been brokered into multi-academy trusts because they were now sponsored academies, had come about the solution in a very similar way. And that prioritization then leads into the plan about what is it we're going to do over the next 100 days, which then takes you into the question about capacity. Now, capacity, if you're leading a small team, is probably going to be the, the capacity that your team provides. It's unlikely that you're going to be able to tap into much resource out of that unless you're working in a collaboration like a trust or a teaching school alliance. But I think it's a legitimate question and a, le a legitimate paragraph to have in your action plan about what capacity there is, even if it recognises that it's a limiting factor on what you're going to be able to do. Then you deliver the improvements that you want. And then the last two bits of the of the strategic improvement plan linked to the vision are really important. And, and, we, and we sometimes miss these out. The first one is the evaluation stage. So we've been working on improving teaching in our department for 100 days. How do we know if it's got better? How do we know what's worked? How do we know what we need to do next? And that question or that posing around the evaluation framework about improvement is a really important part of visioning. And then the final one is I call transmission, which is, okay, so in this particular classroom over here, I've seen some really interesting work taking place around the relationship between assessment and feedback. And that particular teacher has a degree of expertise around it. What I want to see is how do I transmit that practice to the next three classrooms in the corridor or the next three departments in the school or the other schools in my trust? And how do we, how do we transmit that practice from one, one place to another without it feeling like an imposition and without it feeling like we are taking away the ownership of teaching and learning from the teacher in that classroom? It's a real skill to do this well. And when you've been through that process of evaluation and consider the transmission, you revisit the mission vision strategy and you start the next 100 day plan. But what, what, what I like about this model and where I've seen it work really effectively is most visions and strategic improvement plans or school development plans are very cumbersome documents and they last a very long period of time. And, and sometimes life just gets in the way of them. You know, I would imagine every development plan that was in place in January 2020 is now out of date because of COVID. And we've either got to rewrite them or we've got to think about them in these smaller chunks of time. So as you're thinking about your role as a leader in this, I just wanted to share with you a little bit of thinking about how you might that make, make that work. So on this next slide, um, I've made a couple of points this evening about capacity. Uh, and I thought I might just focus upon that a little bit for the moment. Uh, and I call this the capacity pyramid. And there are three elements to it. How do we, so the question I'm trying to resolve in my mind here is how, how, how do we build capacity and where does it come from? So the first challenge is that there is undoubtedly a financial cost to, to capacity um, for, for you uh, in terms of your resourcing or for your school's resource or your trust resource. Where, where are we going to find the capacity that we need to improve the schools that we're working with? Uh, and what will the cost of that be? So it would be very naive to assume that there isn't a financial implication to this. But the point I want to make to you is it's not the only implication. In the bottom right hand corner, um, there is a capacity issue around time and duration needed to build that capacity. Now, in some respects, we don't really have very much control over the financial cost. Um, our budgets are whatever the government determines the education budget is going to be and the spending envelope is on a year to year or three to three year basis. But we do have more say over how we ask people to spend their time. And so when you think about the working week and you think about the number of hours that people have. So um, the workforce um, workload census in 2016 had the average working week for secondary and primary teachers at roughly 59 hours. It was slightly higher in secondary, but it was 50, it was decimal point difference, 59.6, say, place 59.2. It was largely a 59 hour week in 2016. When that was repeated in 2019, it came down to 56 in secondary uh, and 55 in primary. So progress of sorts, three, three to four hours difference. But it still leaves a really interesting question to me, which is in, in most of our schools, even if you're on the highest contact ratio, I doubt if many people are teaching more than 22 contact hours in a working week. So if our average week in secondary and primary is over 50 hours, 
what are we doing with the other 30 hours? And, and how can we engage as leaders in how we ask people to spend their time? How much of that time is spent duplicating lesson preparation that other people could do for us, that we could actually ask one person to prepare that suite of lessons and we use their plans? How much time is spent just giving information to people? How much time is spent giving CPD opportunities to groups of people where everybody gets the same input, even though they all need something different? So think when you're building capacity and you're thinking about your improvement planning about this concept of how you use time as well. And then the third in the bottom left hand corner is about talent and intellectual development. Um, there is a partly financial cost to it, although I don't think it's the, it's, the, it's the biggest lever. But there's something here about the time it takes to improve the way that we teach. There's no quick fix to turning a requiring improvement teacher into a securely good teacher. It's the product of coaching, uh, feedback. It's the product of team teaching. It's the product of research, evidence-based um, CPD. And these things take time. So if you're responsible in your school or your trust for thinking about professional development and talent development, then recognizing that there is a continuum around this, that this takes time as well to build that intellectual capacity gives you an opportunity to, have to develop a different language with people who are the budget holders in your organization who you might be talking to about releasing funding to help you that it's not just about money it's about time and it's about talent as well so if you relate the capacity pyramid to the capacity bubble on the previous slide in the school improvement cycle you begin to see a little bit about how how you can start making this this, this uh, a cohesive whole the next slide please sir um, so in, in the book that I published in the summer, we called this the spaghetti diagram. Um, and, and this began life uh, as, a, as a handwritten drawing with felt pens. Um, and what I was trying to do at the time was to explain um, to policymakers in the Department for Education that school improvement isn't linear uh, and there isn't just one way to do it. Um, and the Holy Grail isn't just about getting every school in the country to outstanding, that it's much more subtle than that. So the first thing I drew was the, the axis along the bottom, which you see I've called time. And I've deliberately not put any numbers on that because I think the, the reality about school improvement, particularly if you're talking about schools that are deeply special measures and, and, and where there's a long way to go, is that it's probably somewhere between three to five years to make that school a securely good, consistently good school that won't ever fall back to where it was when it started. And so what you see on the time continuum is that schools uh, are making that, that, that continuous improvement over that period of time. And there is, a, there is a challenge between the quality of your strategy and your improvement plan and the time it takes the exam results to catch up, because that's where sometimes the delay comes. And sometimes that's a frustrating bit because you know instinctively that what you're doing is working and it's the right plan, but the results just aren't catching up. Because for example, if you're new in the school, and year 11 have had four years of really poor teaching and you've been able to engage and improve teaching for one year in year 11, the likelihood is that you're not gonna have that impact in that time. You're gonna have more impact with year eight and year nine. On the vertical axis are the four phases, the stages that schools go through when they're, when they're improving. And the first phase is about stabilization, which is for me, just that, that chaos to order process. Uh, and how you stabilize a school so it's calm, it settles, and you can begin to layer improvement upon that. The second stage, once you stabilize, is to start to repair the school. And the third stage is the improve phase, and the fourth stage is the sustain phase, where, where actually you're hoping by that point you're a really strong performing school. And whilst I'm using this language to describe schools, this also applies equally to teams, to key stages, um, and I think to individuals as well in teams. And what I tried to do was to describe typically the, the improvement journeys that schools across the country are on. So if I take A at the top of the screen, these would be schools that are traditionally over 20, 25 years, they've been some of the best schools in the system. Um, and no matter what changes happen um, from government, whether it's a new offset framework or a new assessment framework or a new exam system, they cope with it, they deal with it, and they continue to be really strong. Um, the challenge for the sector with those schools is that not enough of them help other schools out. 
a lot of those schools are, are outstanding schools in the maintained sector who tend not to work with other people or single academy trusts who tend not to work with other people either um, and there's a risk to that there's a risk that their capacity doesn't go beyond the own, their own school and we need capacity in this in the sector but there's also a sense that you you can get very complacent very quickly if nobody from outside challenges your thinking so there's there is a there is a consequence of having um, that group on on the grid but nevertheless they're a, they're a very strong and very potent part of our, of our sector uh, at the bottom uh, are the schools i described to you before the schools that were that came into london to help me with this the schools that have been bumping along the bottom of the system and then you have i think the stages in between so you look, look at b for example which is in green on this on the screen or a, green on my, on my screen, schools that go from special measures to outstanding, they happen very rarely, very, very rarely. The way in which uh, that sometimes happens is if the, if the school was, say, on journey C, they were outstanding uh, and they dropped two or three Ofsted grades, usually a safeguarding issue might be behind that. And if you fix that safeguarding issue uh, and you'll make your systems more rigorous, you can improve back because your standards are still fairly secure, even though that particular issue was inadequate. Um, an F and a G on the journey uh, are, the, are, the, are the ones that I think are typical of how most schools in the system improve, which they start off in the stabilised repair phase. In the first year, they, they often, under new leadership, find that, that it's a difficult journey and sometimes standards slip even further in the first year. But what you see quite quickly in the next year, in year two, year three and year four, is that the strategy that's been in place is working, it's doing the right things, it's making the right judgments about what we need to do, and, and the results and the improvement of the confidence of the school starts to grow. So I've put that in this evening because that will describe if you're working in a trust, your school's in the trust, and if you're working in a single school, it'll probably describe elements of your school. So, so thinking about where, where your teams are is really important. So for example, if we did this as a, as, a, as a secondary school and we talked about subject teams, if your English, maths and science teams are in stabilise and repair, but your creative arts is in sustain, the children will get a brilliant arts experience. But in terms of the accountability tables and where the school sits, it's going to struggle because English, maths and science are part of what makes up the judgment of, about schools. So as a head teacher, if I was back in that role, I would be looking to apply this thinking to my teams that I'm responsible for in my school, as well as my whole school in, in that way. And so I, I wanted to give you a, a construct to have a think about that. So on the last couple of slides, I want to say a little bit about, about collaboration, because uh, I made a point at the beginning of this about that. Um, and, and I'll go one stage further and say, I think collaboration is one of those terms that we use very easily and very comfortably in education. But without a degree of clarity around it, I think it can sometimes become a bit of a time and energy trap. And so I wanted to offer you these what I call five tests about whether collaboration can work. And if they do, if, if, if and when it does, these tests, I think, are behind that. So I've talked about the first one about having a really agreed set of priorities that make up the purpose of the collaboration. I think that, that goes without saying. The second bullet, I think, is uh, I call this mutuality, which is where if you're working in collaboration with another team or another school, the expectation should be that both of you are going to learn from it. It won't just be as simple as one school is going to give help to another school. Both schools will get benefits from working together. That's the mutuality phase of the collaborative process. The third is about change. And what I mean by this is that sometimes people engage in collaboration because what they're hoping will happen will be confirmation that what they're doing is okay and they don't need to change anything and that may well be the case but if you go into a collaboration with it on the basis that you don't intend to learn and change anything then you're going to be pretty stifled I think in terms of the opportunity the fourth test is around pace and I could have used the word momentum here as well one of the reasons why collaborations fail is they run on for too long and they lack shape and they lack structure so I think having a very clear start point and a very clear end point of a collaboration is helpful in that so that you can maintain pace and keep and keep the keep the momentum going so people are engaged in it and then the final one is around prioritization which is if you're going to start to do something new and you're going to work with people to work in a different way what are you going to stop doing in order to create the capacity for that to happen so if you're leading a a, a departmental or a team meeting and and what you decided is that you're going to ask people for the next half term to pilot 
um, a new way of closing down lessons, for example, the last 10, 10, 15 minutes of a lesson, because that's something that you want to do across your team. What are you going to ask them to put on one side to give them the space to think about, deeply think about how they're going to do that? And so those collaborative tests, I think, I think are helpful. One of the phrases that I used a lot in the department, and I'm going to use it again on the next slide here, is I talked about capacity givers and I talked about capacity takers. Um, and the reality is that when, when I'm leading a school that's in special measures, I have no choice but to be a capacity taker because I don't have enough people in my school that know what good looks like. So I have to bring it into my school so that people uh, can see where we're trying to get to. Um, and if I'm a really strong school, like those schools I talked about on journey A on the graph, then they should be capacity givers because they built that capacity. They've got enough practice that's really successful that other people will want to learn from. And then I guess the, the, the spectrum at the bottom goes from that moral purpose about why should we do this, that this is one education system and that every single child in the system matters, uh, even though we don't know any, all of them, obviously, we only know the children we work with, but we should have a moral imperative to want to make our whole education system better. If we believe that, then mutual learning around collaboration starts to become a lot easier. And then the acceptance that there are other ways to do things that maybe are better than our own practice becomes an easier thing to, to, to think about. And the sweet spot, of course, is, is in the middle. And the, and the reality is that the vast majority of schools in England have elements of capacity giving and capacity taking. That's why the Venn diagram works. And there's an intersect there. So the circles on my diagram are the same size, but it might well be that for an outstanding school, the capacity giving circle is much much bigger than the capacity taking circle and the special measure school would be vice versa but it's just worth thinking about in your teams who are the capacity givers in your team and who are the capacity takers in your team and and, and where's the ratio and, and the fit between between those two things and on the next slide um, my, my penultimate slide um, I've talked about what I think some of the people do to that and what the expectations are so if you if you personally or your team or your school is a capacity giver these are some of the things on the left that I think are, are really important to take into consideration. Um, it's, it's how you bring uh, a degree of research and evidence-based thinking to, to improvement. It's about how you might challenge and support the current orthodoxy, not because you're using an accountability plan to do that, but you're doing it because actually you want people to move their practice forward quickly. It's how you make use of the capacity that you've drawn upon to accelerate implementation improvement. And it's how you also hold the capacity takers to account for embracing support. I've seen so many conversations where a school that's in difficulty has agreed that somebody is going to come in and help them from a teaching school or from another trust or a school improvement partner. But when it actually comes down to it, there's a block and a barrier that goes up. They actually are resistant to that change. So the responsibility for capacity takers is they have to accept that they need help. They have to be willing to be held to account for accepting that help and embracing the support that's on offer. And so when you, again, you think about it in this phrase about capacity and where are we gonna draw upon it? Remember the pyramid I showed you around finance, time and talent. That also then breaks down into this relationship between giving and taking in terms of capacity, which just again, gives you a bit of a construct for how you think about building um, your improvement plans when you're responsible for doing uh, exactly that. And then I'll finish uh, with a series of questions on this last slide. Um, and these are the questions that I think um, you should be able to answer about the teams that you lead and others who, uh, who are working with you should also have sight of this. So my first question is, are we prioritizing the right improvement sequences? So that goes back to my cycle about the prioritization, the 100 day plan. Are we, are effectively, are we working on the right things? So for example, uh, and I'll paraphrase, we might choose not to work on behavior first because we know that's just gonna be really, really difficult. And what we might, might do is we might decide to work on something that's a bit less contentious. When actually, in fact, if you improve behavior, it would have a ripple effect on a whole range of other things as well. The second one is about the skills and experience in leadership teams. Um, and do you have the right people with the capabilities or are, are, do you have great people doing one job, but you need to change their job to give them, make them have a closer relationship with the improvement priority that you've identified? Have you thought about how much the improvement will cost? Um, the fourth one talks about the order and the sequencing 
that you need to go about the improvement strategy. A bit like I was saying about behavior a moment, a moment ago, key performance indicators. I don't mean targets. I mean, what are you going to use to evaluate the 100 day plan when you get to day 80 that tells you that you're in the right way? This is quite an important one, number six, the balance between weighing the pig and fattening the pig. Of course, you should monitor. Of course, you should use data. But actually, monitoring and data is, is not improvement. It's, it's what it is. It's monitoring and data. It's oversight. You need to use the data to design what you're going to do next. So the weighing the pig, fattening the pig is a very important part of it. Do the people who are functioning in the governance space to whom you report into have the right information to hold you to account? Do, do you give them data? Do you give them metrics that they can understand what it is you're trying to achieve? And if you're in a position where you're drawing down external support or support from your trust or from a teaching school alliance, how effective is it? And, and don't be afraid to say it's not, um, because actually that's a resource that you need to be really, really successful for you. And therefore, you need to be absolutely sure it's doing the job that you wanted it to do. So I, I hope that's helpful um, in terms of painting a picture around this relationship between vision and strategy and, and implementation. Um, I, I hope there's enough in there to, to be useful to the range of leadership roles that we have from the group this evening. Um, but I'm really happy now with Tony to, to have a dialogue with you and answer any questions that you might have, if that's helpful. Thanks, David. Um, I mean, there are there are a couple of things that, that sort of come to mind that I'd like to explore a bit more with you, if that's um, possible. Um, the first is just a, an interesting question that, that is, you know, do you think in schools we pause regularly enough to explore values and, and, and what is driving uh, ourselves and what's driving culture? Great question. Um... I think my top of head answer is probably no, I don't think we do. I, I think I think we take it for granted that the values and the culture that we've developed will will stand the test of time. Uh, and and if if you and I were running a business and, and we employed 20 people and, and the same 20 people were with us for 10 years, then maybe, maybe that's true. But in a school setting, the people change all the time. Every every academic year that goes by every school, primary or secondary school, changes by two year groups. New reception, year six leave. New year seven, year 11, year 13 leave. And so the fact that two year groups come into our school or one leaving, one coming in, that changes one dynamic. And if your turnover is somewhere around 10 to 15% of your staff, your staff turnover as well changes it. So I do think it's, it's helpful to revisit the values and the culture. Um, and, 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 and to think very carefully about it. It's why I think it's such an important strand of induction as well, um, that people really understand the, 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 the things that the people who run the school or the trust that you work for, what they really care about and, and what they expect to see in terms of the behaviours. And then I think the third element of it is that I think behaviours are observable um, most of the time, sometimes not. But if you think about the behaviours we see in schools, there's one, there's one set of behaviours that we see from adults to adults, there's another set from adults to children, and there's a third set from children to children. And I think there's, there's something that's quite interesting, I think, about when you're, uh, particularly as a leader, and you're, and you're on duty, for example, at lunchtime or at break time or, or, or at the end of the day, or if you're doing a learning walk, how you observe and you characterise those behaviours between those, those, those three groups, adults, children and adults, to, 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 to each other, is a really interesting one, because that's often where the manifestation of the culture really sits. Um, it's you know, one of the things when, when I, mean, I haven't done it for a long time because of COVID but when I visit schools and trusts as, as, as you, we've both done in, in respective roles over the years you know within 10 or 15 minutes of sitting in reception and seeing how children who've arrived late are talked to or parents who've arrived upset are talked to or how a visitor to the school is talked to you get a really interesting insight into the culture and you know it, it's I don't think you can draw too many conclusions from it because it's one person but but it's interesting about what what what, what matters to people and, and and what attention to detail there is about the culture in the school so so I, I, I think it's a great question I think it's something that we do need to revisit and we, and we need to keep taking the temperature of yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I think values drive a lot of leadership behaviours and also go a long way to explaining decisions <laughs> around um, prioritisation and, 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 you know, where you've got multiple solutions. You, you often your values are driving the, 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 the right decision. Here's another interesting question for you. You know, we've got a lot of middle leaders on the call. We've got a lot of head teachers, some of which are internally promoted in their schools. 
when they arrive in their new leadership post, do you think it's a sensible thing to do to, to kind of strip it all back a little bit and start with values again to establish yourself as a, as a new leader? 100% I do. Yeah, I, 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 I really think so. So there are huge benefits of being an internal candidate um, because there's the continuity uh, as, as much as anything else um, about, about what, what the program is that, that you're being asked to deliver around it. But here's but here's the here's the issue. The issue is you're the person who's got a new job. Everybody else had the same job they had when you were deputy head, so you aren't the same person anymore. I mean, you are visibly, and you are as a human being, and uh, and you know certain circumstances don't change, but you're in a different role now. And and I I think sometimes people who move from an internal um, deputy appointment to a, becoming a head teacher, for example, don't spend enough time repositioning and representing themselves as the new leader because they're now in a different role and um you know i i i've done quite a lot of work as you know around the first hundred days of headship and one of the things i advocate in that is that you create an opportunity in the first 100 days to have a 15 to 20 minute one-on-one -on -one with everybody that you employ just as just to get used to the fact this is a new relationship to talk a bit about them as people to talk a bit about what your expectations are of them because we could take it for granted that because i've worked with you as a deputy for five years you knew everything about me but but i'm now the head i've now got a different job and actually i am ultimately accountable for this school in a way that i had a shared accountability for it before so i do think the benefits of internal um appointments and internal succession planning are, are really positive ones um, and, and those trusts that grow their own do a great deal of work in this in this space. But I, I still think an important thread of that is, as you alluded to, is that when you are that new leader, having been in the school uh, it, before you were promoted, you have to you have to position yourself in a, in a different way. So people understand that the relationship has changed. The, the people that you are once peers with uh, as deputy heads, if there was another deputy or as assistant heads, they're not peers anymore. You're now their line manager and that changes the dynamic. Um, and, and I see, I think this happens a lot also without stretching the point too far with people when they're earlier in their careers as well. You know, you think about um, somebody who really flies when they start the profession and around about year four or year five um, gets gets promoted to be a head of department in a, in a secondary school, for example. And all of a sudden they're now managing their mates, the people that they were NQTs with five years ago, who, who've seen them be indiscreet in the pub on a Friday night. <laughs> and, now, and, and, and now they're they're the boss. Or you know, in, in, in the team. And that's quite a different, difficult process to make as well sometimes. So I think there is something really important about how we manage that whole move into internal promotion uh, around making clear to people that you, you, you are the same person, but your role has changed and this is how you're going to be. Brilliant. And, and let's just do a little bit on school improvement planning because, um, you know, I mean, I know you would say this because you're one of the sensible voices around school improvement that recognize that for sustainable school improvement, it takes time. Yeah. Now, I see kind of two models in school improvement. The, the first is, you know, where you get an annual plan and you get to where you get to, and then you build on it the following year and so on. Uh, a set against other schools that set out where they want to be at the end of three years yeah. and then plan backwards to achieve that. Do you, you know, the same can be applied. Those models can be applied in teams just as well as schools. Do you have a view about that? Yeah, I, I, I do. I've got slightly more sympathy with the one year idea that you, that you put first about you know, here's a set of priorities this year and then next year we'll build upon when we've got to. I've, I've got a bit more sympathy with that one. I'm, I'm less sure about the longer term three year plan because I think, I think in education, even when we haven't got a pandemic to deal with, things change very quickly. Uh, a new Secretary of State comes in and decides on a, on a new plan. You know, the average tenure of Secretaries of State in education is 17 months. Um, since the since the since the turn of the of the century, two thousand since two thousand, so seventeen months. Every t that's the that's the average duration. So therefore, a new one comes in with a new set of priorities. So I think it's difficult to plan certainty around that. So I think your your strategic intention, the mission, and the vision I described at the beginning of the session, absolutely that lasts for for three years and probably more. But it's one of the reasons why I really like the shorter time frame, the 100 day units, as an example, it doesn't have to be 100 days, but it's 100 days is roughly September to February half term, and then February half term to the end of the year, just gives you an opportunity to see where we are both systemically, but also in terms of the pace of our improvement. Because if you have an improvement plan that is rooted in the few individual leaders that you really want to deliver that, and, and, and they're not around because they've 
they're ill or they leave or something or the or the trust moves into another school then all of a sudden the plan is is got to be reevaluated so i i think that the 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 balance between short medium and long term planning is really important and the closer you get to the classroom so i'm thinking particularly of middle leaders i think that the more the emphasis is upon the short term so if i was a middle leader again i would be thinking definitely in terms of half yearly chunks of improvement planning about what i wanted to do as i became a senior leader i'd be thinking in, tw- in 12 months two sets of 100 days and as a head teacher i would be thinking much more of the 3 to 5 year longer term vision but my team would be delivering the in year in house improvement that i'm looking for and and uh, just one bit about um I, I mean i i've got to be straight with you and my heart sinks when i see large school improvement plans i mean you know what part of today is about alignment i mean presumably you'd have a view about how much a hand a school you know a, a school can handle in terms of priorities yeah i yeah i, I do so in that 100 day plan uh, and, and I, quite a lot of the work that i do now is is helping trusts uh, and schools to, to to work on this and partly because I, I i work in sets of threes in lots of different ways and you, you know you teased me about that in the past about the the three things i'm thinking about all the time but but it works for me and and what i'm thinking about in this, those priorities is one of those priorities of the three will there'll be three priorities one will be brand new that's something that we haven't done before one will be a continu- continuation of the previous 100 days and one will be something that we did maybe last year that i want to take another look at so I think what's really difficult and challenging is to have three brand new initiatives on the go at the same time. I think you have one that's really new that's going to be longer term but you start it and then the other two are continuity and evaluation. Then I think you 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 manage people's pressure points and workload around how much change can people cope with because that's the other element of this. You know it's very it's very dynamic to sit down and write really ambitious and clever plans but if the workforce is fatigued with change then actually they're not going to be able to take on board much more so i think getting the blend and the balance of how many change initiatives you can cope with at one time is a big part of that yeah. and i don't want to put you on the spot and you might want to think really carefully before you answer this question but do you have any current views about the performance of our current secretary of state oh my god do i have a few views uh, <laughs> i was not um, pretending you're answering the question we're recording this aren't we so i'll i'll, I'll be careful um so, so I'm going to try to give you. I'll give you a sensible answer. So, so what we have at the moment is a, is a is a Secretary of State who is working incredibly closely with Number Ten and with Boris Johnson as Prime Minister, and I don't think has a particular passion for education. I think his interest is making the Conservative Party strong and successful. He's been a Chief Whip before, uh, and the role of the Chief Whip is to get MPs to do as they're told. Um, and I think that's probably a role in the, in the shadows that suits him very well. But I, he is not being strong enough, in my view, about standing up for the education sector. So when Number Ten decides that the world is going to turn on its head, the education world turns on its head as well. Um, and and I still know a lot of incredibly good people working in the department uh, who are very frustrated by this. Um, do all the planning you'd expect them to do, and then suddenly see a, a U-turn at five o'clock on a Friday. So it's. It's um, it's the very opposite of that slide I showed you about the improvement cycle. Yeah. Well, thank you for your considered answer. Um, <laughs> I, um, I it just really remains for me to thank you so much for Pleasure. your contributions over the three webinars. Um, you know, the feedback we've had is excellent, and you know, if I might say so, one of your unique skills is to be able to explain complex things well, so people like me and and, and other colleagues. Uh, I understand it. So thank you for your continued commitment to the Southwest and, and Plymouth. And we've been really grateful for your um, for your input. Absolute pleasure, Tony. Lovely to help you and work with you. And, and thanks to everybody in Plymouth for everything you're doing. And I uh, hope to see you soon. Okay. Cheerio. Thanks a lot. Bye.